Be sure you download the note card that goes along with this sermon, and you can print it out, and you can follow along. Fill it in as you follow the sermon. If you like this sermon, want to see more like this, give us a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel. Also, hit the bell notification so you'll be notified when other new content is added to this site. We try to add sermons as often as we can. We'll try to add some Bible question and answers that we've done before in the past. Other things we may be adding to this. If you have questions, leave them in the comments below. If you'd like to follow us on social media, there are links to our social media accounts in the video description below. Now, let's jump into the sermon. As we begin, I don't want to forget to give a shout out to our latest Patreons over at patreon.com and our username there is MacMike. If you would like to help us out uh, with this program, with this channel, uh, go there and you can find out how at MacMike. We are God's workmanship. God is working on us. What great confidence we can have because we know that God is working on us. I want to be God's masterpiece, God's workmanship. I'm confident that God will complete his work. Therefore, I put my faith in his ability to complete his promise. Further, I want to live with you as God's workmanship. However, we need to recognize that being God's workmanship does not mean sitting on our backsides doing nothing as God pulls us by strings or pushes us along his path much like you might a donkey. That would be lazy. Remember, Philippians 2 verse 12 says, we are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Paul explains that our work is valuable because God is working. Our work matters because God is working. But what should our work be? Now that we are confident God is working, what must we do to cooperate with the working of God? How do we live as God's workmanship. This lesson I have entitled, Living as God's Workmanship. Peter, in 1 Peter 1 and verse 5, provides a great growth plan for us if we follow his plan. Peter claims we will be guaranteed an entrance into the eternal kingdom of God. Why? Because we work so hard? No, certainly not. Because God is working with us and makes our work worthwhile. But if we don't cooperate with him, his work does us no good. So let's examine the plan, the life plan that Peter lays out for living as God's workmanship. The first thing we find in this passage, that we can strengthen our foundation. Our foundation is faith. He starts out, add to your faith. That's where it starts. If we follow this plan, he will guarantee us an entrance into the eternal kingdom of God. It starts with that foundation faith. We already have faith. <clears throat> it was a part of what made us Christians to begin with because Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Verse 10, for with the heart one believes and is justified and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 8, Peter says, if these qualities are yours, and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says these qualities must be increasing. And after he's finished this section, verse 10, he says, Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent 
to confirm your calling and election. We must be diligent about these characteristics. The term translated diligence is elsewhere translated as eager. In Ephesians 4 verse 3, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. In Hebrews chapter 4 verse 11, it's translated as strive. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest. We must exert will and action in these characteristics. Growth is not accidental. We must purpose and plan to grow. Then he says, if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. Notice, we must practice faith. We must pray, make it a practice. We must make it a lifestyle. That is, we must do those things which increase faith. How does faith come? Romans 10, 17, from hearing and hearing by the word of God. And those things which demonstrate faith. Romans 1 and verse 5, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith. James explains a faith that is not demonstrated through sub, uh, submission is not faith at all. It is dead faith. Galatians 2.20, Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. If we are living as God's workmanship, we must live in and by our faith. It starts with faith. Faith is the foundation. And then building on that foundation, virtue is simply the idea of doing what is right because it is right no matter the consequences it's described by paul in ephesians chapter 4 verse 17 laying aside the old man and putting on the new your part of virtue has already begun in baptism, you built on and made perfect your faith through accepting God's promise in baptism. Notice James chapter 2 and verse 22. He said, you see that faith was active along with his works and faith was completed by his works and the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. Verse 24, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. In Colossians chapter 2 and verse 12, having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith, there's that foundation, in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Now you must add two that virtue. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God. It's breathed out by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. If God's word does not authorize the work, that course of action is not virtuous no matter what anyone else says or what you may think. No doubt, if what we are trying to do is prove how righteous we are, we are so we can get to, into heaven, our righteousness only looks like filthy rags, as Isaiah said. He said in Isaiah 64, 6, we have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf and our iniquities like the wind take us away. God saved us by grace through faith so that we should walk in it. Therefore, having been saved, we want to walk like a saved person, pursuing those good works, and that is what virtue is all about, walking in the good works God prepared for us. But don't be destroyed. 
have knowledge. In Hosea 4 and verse 6, Hosea says there, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Jesus told the Sadducees, You are wrong because you know neither the Scripture. Matthew 22 verse 29. Jesus also said, You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Hosea goes on to say why they're destroyed for lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. We're seeing a cycle. Our faith comes by hearing. That is, we begin with some knowledge which led to faith. Our faith produced virtue, and to know what was virtuous, we had to study our Bibles, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. This study increases our knowledge, and the increased knowledge produces greater faith. Upward we go, on to the cycle. Psalm 119, verse 11. I have stored up your word, or I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you, the psalmist says. More than just reading the Bible, you must learn it. Hide it in your heart. We find that Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, in the temptation by the devil, he responded from his knowledge of the scriptures, and three times he said, it is written, calling scripture to mind. John 17 and verse 17, the reality is we don't have to know very much to enter Christ, but we must not believe that being satisfied with entry-level knowledge is living as God's workmanship. According to John 17, 17, God sanctifies them by truth, which is his word. Sanctification is the ongoing process of being set apart for God's holy use. As we learned earlier, one of God's tools in working on us is his word. But his word can't work on us if we aren't opening it and learning it. If you want to live as God's workmanship, work on your knowledge. And then we're to stand on the feet God gave you. Self-control. We're to practice self-control. Romans chapter 6 and in verse 16 explains the problem we've had. Before entering Christ, we chose sin. When we submitted to sin, we became slaves of sin. Sin took over. We didn't have self-control. We were under sin control. He says here, Do you not know that if you present yourself to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin which leads to death or of obedience which leads to righteousness? Romans chapter 7 verse 14 demonstrates this very struggle. As Paul had it before entering Christ, so bad was his struggle, notice. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh sold under sin. For I do not understand my own action, for what I do not do, what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Later on, he would say, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? The body that seemed to be under a law of sin and death would be set free in Jesus Christ. Rather than being under sin's control, the Spirit would bring life to our mortal bodies. Romans chapter 8, verse 11, if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. This paves the way for self-control. Proverbs 14, 12, Proverbs 16, 25 says, There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. So don't misunderstand. Self-control is not, not achieved by relying on self. We tried that already. 
Where did it get us? Self-control comes from relying on God. Proverbs 3, 5 said we must not lean or rely on our understanding, but rather trust in the Lord. We recognize that Galatians 5, verse 22 through 23 presents self-control as a fruit of the Spirit. So we don't pursue self-control by just trying to white-knuckle our way through God's will. We pursue self-control by pursuing the Spirit's lead. Bob's your uncle on that one. As Galatians 2.20 said, Christ lives in us. We live by faith. We must pursue self-control by pursuing faith in Jesus Christ and in his way. In Psalm 141, David was seeking self-control. Notice the two-pronged approach. He didn't just say, hey, God, look at me, control myself. Rather, he says, O oh Lord, I call upon you. He says, hasten to me, give ear to my voice. And when I call to you, let my prayer be counted as incense before you and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Now watch verse 3 and 4. He says, set a guard, O oh Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. He prayed that God would act in his life, setting a God over his heart, directing his heart, and protecting him from relationships with wicked man. And in verse four, 5 of Psalm 41, Let a righteous man strike me. It is a kindness. Let him rebuke me. It is oil for my head. Let my head not refuse it. He asked for help in his self-control from others. To pursue self-control, find righteous people who will strike you and smite you, hit you when you go astray. Find people who will provoke you to love and good works. Hebrews 10 verse 24. 1 Corinthians 10 and in verse 12, always remember this. If we are trusting in ourselves that we are standing, we will fall. Self-control then is not standing on our own two feet as I once thought. Rather, self-control is learning to stand on the feet that God has given us. So therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. Then we must keep on keeping on. That is, we must be steadfast. Steadfastness is determining to serve God until the end. James 5 and verse 7 says, Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. However, it's much more than serving God throughout the day-to-day -day humdrum activities. It means serving God even through hardship. It is endurance even in the face of greatest suffering. Notice Hebrews 11 and verse 24 about the suffering of Moses. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated. Look at that with the people of God that enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin for a season. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. It means not being distracted by the things of the world. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, If we're risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is now sitting. Let your affections be on things above, not on things on the earth. It means facing hatred and persecution, but continuing anyway without soft peddling the gospel. To see a true example of this, look at Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 35. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured. Look at the suffering refusing to accept relief so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging, even chains and imprisonment. 
They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. We're to be steadfast even in the face of trials. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 6 we see, in this, he said, you rejoice, though now for a little while, he says, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Chapter 4, verse 12, beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening. And then verse 13, but rejoice in so far as you share Christ's suffering, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. He's encouraging the Christian to be steadfast in the face of trial. But remember also, be steadfast in the face of false teachers. In this letter, he encourages them to maintain that steadfastness in the face of false teachers. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, false teachers will be encouraging them to pursue sensuality, how easy it is to pursue that wide road rather than God's narrow road, but it leads to death. Notice 2 Peter 2, verse 1. False prophets also arose among the people just as there will be false teachers. There are no false prophets today because there's no true prophets today among us. These false teachers will secretly bring in destructive heresy, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. Many will follow their sensuality or pernicious ways. Because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and he talks about their destruction. Its end leads to death. So steadfast, even in the face of those who say God won't keep his promise, as we see pointed out in Second Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. This, he said, is the second letter that I'm writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I'm stirring you up. He said, up your sincere mind by way of remembrance that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through our apostles, knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, <clears throat> following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? Look, they say God won't keep his promises. For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlooked this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water through water by the word of God. And that by means of these the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. He says, do not look, overlook this one fact, beloved, that, the day, that one day is a thousand years and a thousand years is one day to the Lord. He said, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises. He's going to fulfill his promises as some count slowness, but he's patient toward us, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. The day of the Lord will come, how? Like a thief in the night. Then the heavens will pass away with a roar. The heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on them will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of person ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, here's his promise, he's going to keep it, we are waiting for new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. And in steadfast, even in the face of hardship and trials, 
awaiting us. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life to which you recall and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Hardships and trials will away. But then grow your relationship with God through godliness. When we enter a relationship with God, we're to become godly. You became a Christian because you feared God. You became a Christian because of your attitude towards who He is and what He does. Growing in godliness means growing in that relationship. The word, the term godliness is from the word, the Greek word, ispia, euspia. And this is a contraction of two terms, one meaning good, you, EU, and the other meaning reverence, sabana. It is reverence for and piety toward God. However, as we learned earlier, like, like faith, it's not just an attitude. Godliness is to be our diligent practice. In 2 Peter 3, verse 11 and 12, we are asked, since judgment is coming, what kind of lives should we lead? And he says, in holiness and godliness. So there's that contraction. It's a reverence for and a piety toward God. What would be the ultimate way of practicing piety toward God? That's the question. And the answer is imitation. That would be the ultimate piety toward God. Paul commanded us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1 to imitate him as he imitates Christ. Peter said we are to be holy. Why? Because God is holy. That is imitating God's holiness. Living as God's workmanship means living with reverence for God. Living as God's workmanship means le uh, living with reverence for God. Have a devotion and piety toward God that is demonstrated by living as God would. And the question that was so popular a few years ago what would Jesus do is a great guide for this aspect as long as we are basing our answer on what the Bible really says about him. Then, grow your relationship with brethren through brotherly affection. When we enter a relationship with God, we are placed in a relationship with others. 1 John 1, 7 points this out. We have fellowship one with another. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all unrighteousness, he says there. Living as God's workmanship means growing in your relationship with those others. This word brotherly affection comes from the word Philadelphia. Philadelphos, Philadelphos. It comes from one, first of all, philos, meaning friend, and Adelphos, brother, or love. We talk about a lot of time. Phileos, philos, brotherly love, brotherly affection. Thus, we are to be friends with our brothers. We are to love our brothers as in our physical families. In Christ, we do not choose who our brothers are. But in relationships, we choose who our friends are. Peter says we must choose to be friends with our brethren. Romans 12, 10, love one another with brotherly love or brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing on. What do we typically find among our friends? We typically make friends with those who have what? The same interests, the same desires, the same goals, 
as we have. What greater similarity could we have than going to heaven and taking others with us? Another question, how do you treat a friend with kindness and patience? You help them overcome their problems. You accept them, uh, help from them with your problems. You work through relational difficulties. You work through those difficulties. You speak well of them. You spend time with them. Look at all your brethren. How do you treat them? Be a friend to them. Live with others like they are God's workmanship. And if you would live as God's workmanship, you must be a friend to your brethren. And by the way, notice this is not waiting around for your brethren to be friends with you. You are to be a friend. And then we come to this one, this point. Being like God, love. Now that you're a Christian, your outlook and action toward everyone changes. This love encompasses the previous two points. In Matthew 22 and verse 36, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it. What's the second? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Remember the lawyer stood up to put Jesus to a test. He said, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, what's written in the law? How do you read it? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, you have said, said to him, you have answered correctly, do this and you will live. He tells him. In fact, Jesus' parable that continues after this in verse 30 through 37 about the Good Samaritan is an illustration of this love that this lawyer is supposed to have. The love was demonstrated between enemies, a Samaritan and a Jew. An unconditional love we see here. We are to love all no matter what they have done. They do not have to be pretty, rich, or even friendly. They just have to be there. God is our model for this love. In Matthew chapter 5, and in verse 33, he said, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor, hate your enemies. Jesus said, But I say to you, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be the sons of your Father who is in heaven, for he makes his sun to rise on the evil and the good, and sends the rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. 1 Corinthians 13. And in verse 4, we learn that love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude, it does not insist on its own way, it is not irritable or resentful, it does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth, and love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. An enlightening exercise is to take each of the attributes of love and see if you can honestly apply them to yourself. Instead of saying love is perfect, is, per is patient, can you insert your name? For example, say James Lewis, if that's your name, is patient. Or Joe Doak is patient. Or Eloise is patient. Or Bertha, but Bertha is patient. And take it a step further. Instead of thinking nebulously about your overall character, ask yourself these questions about particular relationship. Say, is James Lewis patient with Bertha? And think about it like this. God is working on us. That means more and more of him is going to be in us the more he works on us. 
it's no accident that Peter ends this list with love. After all, God is love. 1 John 4 and 8. And if we are growing as God's workmanship, we will wind up here and we will also be loved. Bob's your uncle, brother. Grow in these qualities. Then there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 1 and verse 11. Next verse in the verses we consider. The goal of God's work in our lives is to usher us into his presence for all eternity. He is making us into effective citizens in his kingdom. But if we won't cooperate with his work, his work will be in vain, according to 1 Corinthians 15.10. However, the great thing is we know we can work on these things because God is working on us. Our work is effective because of God's work. Philippians 2, 12, and 13. Question is, are you living as God's workmanship? The question starts, and it all starts from right here. What must I do to be saved? Saved left out there, but to be saved, what we're considering. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. He who comes to God must believe that he is, Hebrews 11, 6. He's the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Jesus said, I'm going away and you will seek me and you will die in your sins. For where I go, you cannot go. And he says, you will die in your sin. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. He commands all men everywhere to repent. The time of this ignorance got overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. We see in Romans 10.10 10, that, that we are to confess Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Acts 2.38 Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Romans 6.3 and 4 We learn that baptism is a burial. And that, brethren is how you get into Christ, Galatians 3.27, through baptism, and Bob's your uncle. That's what you must do to be saved. Thanks for joining us. Remember, you can go to patreon.com if you would like to help us with this uh, production of this on this channel. Remember, if you're in the Spring Hill area, Spring Hill Church of Christ meets Sunday Bible study 9.35, worship service 10.45 a.m. and 4 p.m. in the pre-evening, Wednesday Bible study, 6.30 p.m. Come join us or watch us through the internet at these various locations that we have available for that. And don't forget, download the note card that will help you with this lesson.